So we've been talking with Andy Gettinger about uh, all the issues around selecting an EHR, um, the process of knowing whether you're ready. And, uh, you know, once you've gone through that process and we've talked about just the importance of, of bringing the stakeholders into that process and, and taking your time in that process, now we've got a vendor um, and we're ready to uh, really uh, dig in. And uh, so, Andy, tell me a little bit about the implementation. The implementation becomes a multi-year project that starts by um, building a team. And the vendor we chose um, has on their side a team that they put together. And then we put a team together. And together that joint team goes through a process that first does what's called an exploration, where they come on site, they go to a whole bunch of different venues, ambulatory, inpatient, operating room, emergency room, to see what we're doing today. And then the team goes back and configures the software to meet the processes that they've observed that um, are uh, specific to the institution. It's one of the reasons why the ability to take um, an implementation from one institution and move it to the other another institution is so difficult because medicine is such a cottage industry. Um, each academic medical center uh, functions somewhat differently. Mm -hmm. and, and so that aspect is, is the first part of the process. The second part of the process is then what's called validation. Now the teams come back and again meet with the same group of folks and say, this is what we um, observed, this is how the new system will work, and they use a green light, yellow light, red light. Um, does it work for you, that's green light? Um, does it mostly work for you, but there are a couple of things that we need to adjust, that's yellow light, and then the red light, is, the red lights are the challenging ones. Uh, where the user community says, no, that's not gonna work at all, you need to do it differently, we do it differently. And so the team hears that and then goes back and makes those adjustments. And then uh, the institution commits to a training process. So how do you then get your workforce um, able to make the transition from the existing, in our case, uh, EHR, to the new EHR? Well, part of that education is um, uh, challenging because what we said, and I think what most institutions do, is say that training is not optional. And we took uh, clinicians and basically said they had 12 to 16 hours of training. So that's a big cost, but then you also have to configure the training so that it makes sense, which is actually difficult to do for 7,500 or so uh, individuals, just the space. So we took out our entire conference uh, facilities for a six month period to be able to do training and then they, they served as our command center. We built additional, six additional training classrooms that could handle 15 folks at a time with trainers that we had to train the trainers to be able to then do the training. So it was a very complex training process. Um, so when that's all said and done, the other piece you have to do is say how much of your old EHR is going to be migrated to your new EHR. This is a, uh, an area of, of um, a challenge because we had over 20 years worth of data in our old EHR and coming into the project we had assumed that because of similar technical infrastructure a lot of that data would flow to the new EHR. What we found early in the process was that was not actually not going to be the case and that we had to do data abstraction and so we asked our clinicians as part of the training effort to do to actually take some of the data on their own patients especially the ones that were scheduled to come soon after the transition and actually convert some of that data so that when they then started using the new system the data would be there um, the advantage of that is not only did they convert it, the clinicians who actually knew the patients knew which elements of the data needed to be converted. Other institutions have done the same thing but hired data abstractors who really don't know what are the key and essential points involved in a, in a patient's care that need to be ported over. 
So finally, what we did is we took our, our really superb development team and said, we're never going to be able to convert all of the data. So give us a way that is um, efficient for us to be in the new system, but refer back to the old system. And in fact, we developed something called a, well, it's, it's a um, form of what the, in, what the industry calls CCAO. CCAO is an HL7 standard. It stands for Clinical Context Object Workgroup. What translating that jargon it means, I'm uh, authenticated to the record. I pick a patient and then I move to another application. It knows that it's me and it knows which patient I've chosen. The time saving in that is phenomenal. And that aspect of the project um, uh, facilitated this fairly substantial transition. And then you have to prepare a command center. And, and, and actually, uh, uh, incident command, decide when you're going to make this big transition, work down the elective procedures so that you don't have a lot of patients in the hospital. You can't change how many patients come to the emergency room or need emergency surgery or emergency medicine care or that the helicopter brings in. So those are not um, variables that you can constrain, but you can constrain how many patients come in for elective procedures, which we did. We canceled all vacations for the window of time that we went live for two weeks. We double staffed so that if we were less efficient in our clinical care, no patient would, would suffer because we had twice as many staff on both the inpatient and the outpatient side to help care for folks. And so all of that planning had to occur and be orchestrated. And we had to make um, decisions about the go-live date about 10 months in order to get on all the calendars um, and make sure away time was appropriately managed uh, long before we actually came uh, to the go-live date. So uh, you come to that, that magical moment, uh, the go-live date, and uh, now you're sitting a, a year past that time uh, for your experience. When you look back at that, uh, at that, um, that moment, that week of uh, going live, what did you learn and what were some of the surprises? You know, what were things that uh, you wish you knew going into that go live period? The industry describes what we did as a big bang. Um, we simultaneously went live on all of our ambulatory practices, our inpatient practice, the operating room, the emergency room. We went simultaneously live with all of our nursing documentation our CPOE, that um, computerized provider order entry. All of that happened in a moment. Now the industry calls that a big bang. Actually, as it turns out, um, very few other institutions um, have chosen to do what we did. Other institutions talk about a big bang as something that occurs over weeks to a month. We did it at a moment in time. So I actually started calling it a tsunami of change, and um, some of my colleagues weren't happy with that term, although in retrospect, I think that term um, was pretty accurate. Um, tsunamis can be destructive, but out of, out of that tremendous amount of change comes all kinds of opportunity. So some of the things that, that in hindsight um, I would have done differently is we had round-the-clock coverage for the first two weeks. In fact, um, I had 30 doctors relieved from their clinical practice to be a SWAT team to go out and help other, other doctors who were having trouble using the system. Um, we said two weeks is what, what we anticipated we needed. In retrospect, we actually needed a far bit longer than two weeks. And so I would probably have that kind of commitment that goes on for several months, not several weeks maybe not as many, and maybe not um, round the clock the way we initially did, um, but certainly we um, under-supported. The other element um, that we did is uh, we didn't have as much of the specialty software developed and built out. 
And so what that meant is some of our subspecialists and super specialists were using the electronic health record in its more generic form. They could do everything they needed to do, but it was not as time efficient for them. And so um, we, we had great amount of frustration on the part of our clinicians. And some of that frustration persists today because, in fact, um, this is very different than going to a car dealer and buying a car where you drive that car off the dealer's lot and it's the way the car is going to be. Most institutions that deploy an electronic health record find that after they deploy it, they have to do a substantial amount of adjustment to make it usable for the institution. And what we learned from the president and CEO of the vendor that we chose was um, that individual had watched lots and lots of in other institutions do this. And the observation was lots of time spent anticipating how it's going to work was not as valuable as the time spent adjusting when you're actually using it so that you know how it works and what adjustments need to be made. So we took that as um, one of our design principles. And then because of the size and scope of our deployment, we actually didn't have enough resources to do that rapid adjustment phase as effectively as we might have wanted to. When you look at the research around large EHR implementations, it's mixed. That is, when people look for the benefits, there's been a lot of controversy about whether these systems really deliver reduced costs or improve quality. Um, in your case, and in many cases, I think the institutions felt they had no choice. They had to implement a, a, a new uh, enterprise system. But when you think about uh, Dartmouth's experience, do you expect to see quality uh, and cost benefits over time? An implementation like ours um, is going to be judged in um, graded steps. What we did um, a little over a year ago was necessary but not sufficient to achieve those outcomes. Everybody imagines an EHR with all the sophisticated advanced features and all of those um, depend on time to be developed and implemented. Most of the EHR literature that demonstrated positive outcomes that are really meaningful came from institutions that had done their own development. So fewer and fewer of those kind of pretty solid literature um, uh, demonstrated improvements um, came from the kind of systems that are now being deployed. So it's an interesting paradox. Um, the systems, because the vendors don't want to get into the space of decision support and configuration, because the market is so variable, that institutions all have to do that by themselves. And so a future state potentially would be more agreement, perhaps, perhaps, I'm not sure, a little bit more regulation um, to allow institutions to get uh, further faster in some of these more advanced things that I believe will actually have an impact on um, on quality and uh, actually efficiency and, and, and potentially even cost savings. The cost savings come when you're able to aggregate information from outside sources and that's called interoperability and the reality is that um, the standards for interoperability have not been well articulated and therefore it's actually harder to share information back and forth. I mean, it's embarrassing to acknowledge that many folks who send us information, and in our case, when we send information out, we print it, it goes to the other institution, it's scanned into the electronic health record. Yes, it's all available in, in, in a digital format, but it's not an actionable digital format. I can't share a medication list on a patient. And in fact, one of the other, um, I, I have to say, disappointments for me was um, that notion of medication management. Um, we know that um, patients um, have medication uh, errors and consequences 
that we we debate whether there are how many lives are lost because of those kind of errors but it's a measurable number of lives and one of the opportunities with an electronic health record that does e-prescribing is that you could get information back from the places where prescriptions are filed so those are at drug stores and pharmacies and the drug stores and pharmacies participate with pharmacy benefits managers and the pharmacy benefits managers have all the information about the patient's medical history whether we prescribed it it was prescribed in a, a local community or in the case of our patients many of them go to florida and other places during the winter if it's prescribed in florida we could get all that information in and so we we purchased and deployed that solution within our electronic health record um, it actually didn't work very well and in fact that's what that's what many folks have found there's really only one vendor who does this work and and there there you know this is perhaps a comment on the monopoly so when I look at a project like ours and I start to articulate um, the challenges and the potential benefits, I think um, we are on the road to achieve benefits. The benefits we'll achieve are uh, dependent on our continuing to adjust the system and to have our clinicians start to actually learn how to use the system the way the system's designed. That's an important point. Um, in fact, the current status of EHRs are that they're really designed and you have to use them the way they're intended. And some of those designs are not necessarily the way clinicians practice. We'll talk, I think, a little bit more about that in a moment. The um, opportunity, though, um, and the benefits really come from the ability to have greater insight into our practice. What works and what doesn't work, um, it's not widely known, but much of what we do hasn't been actually tested in a rigorous randomized controlled trial. And so if each patient encounter is recorded in a way that the outcome is available for further insight and investigation, and whether you call that quality assurance or quality improvement or research, um, I believe these systems will enable us to understand what elements of the care we provide really are working and what need to be adjusted.